Namaste. So let's continue with Vichara Sangraham and the answer or the continuation of the answer to the previous sutra which we covered in the last video. Devotee, is the aforesaid self-experience possible even in the state of empirical existence for the mind which has to perform functions in accordance with its prarabdha, the past karma which has begun to fructify? Maharshi, a brahmana may play various parts in a drama, yet the thought that he is a brahmana does not leave his mind. Similarly, when one is engaged in various empirical acts, there should be the firm conviction, I am the self, without allowing the false idea, I am the body, etc., to rise. If the mind should stray away from this state, then immediately one should inquire, Oh, oh, we are not the body, etc. Who are we? And thus one should reinstate the mind in that pure state. So this has to do with our real identity. Our identity is not the body, or anything based on the body. Like, for example, one's job or one's role in the family or one's name or occupation or any of those things, any uh, attachments or labels that belong to the body. That's not our identity. Our identity is that we are the self. And that self is simply reflected in this body and mind. And that's why the body and mind appear to have life and consciousness and so forth. We discussed that back in the Drig Drishya Vivekaha series. So what is animating this body and mind? is the real identity. And the real identity is completely beyond anything in the world. Because the self is not conditioned by anything. Even the karma. Huh? The karma belongs to the body and mind. Karma but does not affect the self. So when things happen in the empirical world, and they happen. We don't do them. Huh? We're not the doers. Things happen according to our, our karma. Then our job <laughs> is to remain focused on the truth that I am the self, aham brahmasmi, and not to get caught up in the temporary body and all the different labels and designations attached to it. So this is the real sage. This is the real enlightened one. This is someone who has realized their true identity, their real self. But that's not the end. He goes on. The inquiry, who am I, is the principal means to the removal of all misery and the attainment of the supreme bliss. When in this manner the mind becomes quiescent in its own state, self-experience arises of its own accord, without any hindrance. Thereafter, sensory pleasures and pains will not affect the mind. All phenomena will appear then, without attachment, like a dream. Never forgetting one's plenary self-experience is real bhakti, devotion. Yoga, mind control, jnana, knowledge, and all other austerities. Thus say the sages. So in other words, one doesn't have to go around saying, who am I, who am I, like a mantra. <laughs> 
That's not the point at all. The truth is beyond words. It's an experience, a state of being, a state of consciousness. So whether you call it Brahman or Nirvana or Nibbana or self-realization or the kingdom of heaven, whatever you call it, it's beyond the enjoyment and suffering of the material body and mind. It cannot be expressed in words because it is transcendental. It is fundamentally different from ordinary experience and it's inexpressible in words. We use words to help kind of point people in the right direction, but words will not really help you to realize the self. You have to do the inquiry for yourself. In other words, sit down and look deeply into your experience and identify that which never changes, which is always the same, which is the root of your existence. Just like in the beginning of the universe, Lord Brahma found himself sitting on a lotus flower in the midst of a vast ocean with great waves. And he was like, how did I get here? <laughs> he didn't know. So what is the first thing he did? He entered into the stem of his lotus and he went down to the root to try to find the beginning of his, his origin where he came out, where he came into the world. You see, so this is also our job. We have to go deep into the mind and find the root of consciousness, of being, the reality, that which is not conditioned by anything in the world, and realize that we are that, Brahman then throw away all this other stuff, these temporary identities based on the body and the mind, on words and labels, and rest in the certainty that I am the self. This is the point. And thereafter, the self experience will arise spontaneously. See, all of the great realizations, all of the true advancement in spiritual life is spontaneous. It's not something that you do. Yes, you can do the methods that lead up to it, but the actual realization always is spontaneous and self-arising. And that's true of well, the, the boundary between karma yoga and bhakti yoga, between bhakti yoga and raja yoga, and between raja yoga and jnana. It's an experience which arises all by itself once the underlying conditions have been met. So the various methods of sadhana are simply to help us meet those conditions and prepare ourselves for the realization or the revelation of the actual realization of the self. So what Ramana is suggesting here is that jnana, bhakti, and karma yoga even are perfected in the inquiry into the self self with a capital S, the real self. Everything else is ego, subject to change, conditioned by material circumstances, birth and the changing environment and so on. 
You notice how in this world, nothing remains the same. It's always in flux. But there is one thing that does always remain the same, and that is consciousness. We're always conscious, even though the object of consciousness or the contents of consciousness may change. The fact of consciousness is the one thing that never changes, even during deep sleep. So this is what we have to search after. This is what we have to inquire into. Not with words, but by sincerely looking into it, going down uh, the stem of the lotus <laughs> to find the root. And this is the method that leads to total self-realization. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.